where we have just stopped. So what we had was the idea of Eurasianism, perhaps even the ideology, how it has developed, um, what does it mean, why is it so important right now and hasn't been that important earlier. So we now, in this uh, second session, come to the questions of implementation. My name is Heiko Kleines. I'm from the Research Center for East European Studies at the University of Bremen. And I have the honor and I hope also the pleasure to chair this session. And I'm not going to say much more, because if you look at the program, we will have lunch after this session. There's only 40 minutes for lunch. So if you want to get anything to eat today, we need to be right in time with this panel. So we immediately start with the first presentation which has been co-authored by Rika together with Katarina Wolczuk. And it's actually about, as I said, impl implementation, the institutional design and development of Eurasian integration with sort of a look at the EU. 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. I shall try to be on time. Um, so, we've seen in the first panel the incredibly interesting dynamics and the substance of, of how rich the substance of this project is and how multi-layered it is. And um, it's given me a lot of food for thought, this relationship between the Eurasian statecraft and the cultural metrics that Richard spoke to to implement and develop this project. And in a way, we want to add another ingredient to this cooking pot, namely that despite all the Eurasianist discourse, historical richness, and difference in cultural matrix, what they actually want to do is very much in the image of the EU. The sort of EU-likeness narrative has been an extremely important ingredient, as we will try to show. And in a way, the paper is uh, addresses, starts with this narrative, then it actually looks at the institutional emulation, the sort of design features, this is where um, I as a stray lawyer come into play, and the institutional context, and ultimately we offer a few explanations for the observed pattern of uh, emulation of the European Union from the experience of the European Union. And the narrative, in a way, is summed up in this quote offered by Tatiana Valavaya, who is a minister of, in the Commission, the Eurasian Economic Commission, pretty much sort of the second in command of, of the uh, civil servants, technocrats implementing the project. And what she says there is very interesting because she reiterates, firstly, the importance of the styling of the project as European-like. Second, the continuity of this benchmarking, you know, chose and continue to choose European models. It also, what becomes clear is the, the, the rationalization of this borrowing is the only functional model. Um, then it's also a rationalization with regard to its global appeal. It is used as an example in Eurasia, Latin America and other parts of the world. And interestingly enough, this global appeal hasn't lost its uh, power of attraction despite the problems of the European Union, some of which have become very acute, tells us Minister Valava, and also despite the point that Richard made, that you know, it's, it's actually despite the fact that uh, Russia has been trying to challenge the EU, nonetheless it still refers to this model as a very functioning sort of styling model for its own um, institutions. And what we see clearly is a confluence of complex processes. One is the region building that we've been talking about. And in a way, it is, it's, it's this various axis of realignment, political, economic. We have the CIS of the 12, we have the 5, the 3, the, the this, the that. You know, the geography and the various axes of realignment have been absolutely uh, complex. Then we have on top of that the process that international law and international relations scholars refer to as the institutionalization, where we move from the unstructured cooperation of the CIS and especially the early days of the CIS, where you have just treaties, just agreements, even refusal to adopt common bodies, to gradual institutionalization, you know, adoption of, of bodies, 
and development into a full-fledged international organization with decision-making executive, parliamentary and dispute resolution bodies. And so what we're focusing here is also, is actually on top of that process of institutionalization. We're looking at the emulation as emulation of EU style or high or hard law or legalized type of borrowing where there are clear references one to the economic model, which is the deep economic integration, the progression from free trade, customs union, common market, economic union, but also the pooling of sovereignty, which in a way we look at only three, uh, only three ingredients, which is the common binding legislative order, the supranational delegation to a decision-making authority expressed in things like qualified majority, <coughs> and also the presence of a permanent third-party binding dispute resolution mechanism. So, indeed, it, it is a complex process. And we've looked at Russia-centered initiatives, as previous speakers indicated, there's been, a, there's been a proliferation, there's a lot of going on there in this whole region, and we've looked at design, and we've sort of CIS Economic Union, the Customs Union, um, the, the Eurasian economic community, the uh, common economic space that uh, Peter mentioned several times, and then the Eurasian customs union, single economic space, and the treaty, depending, we are told, it will be uh, start from January 2015, but we'll see a draft is still not available of the Eurasian economic union. Breathe deeply. <laughs> I'm just passing slowly, but quickly over that. Um, we see definitely clear development of both design institutionalization and emulation of EU practices. And you know, the first phase, which is the sort of pre-Eurasian customs union phase, what we see is if one looks at the institutionalization, the first column. It is fairly low institutionalization. They're primarily treaty regimes, international agreement-based regimes, embedded with, without international organizations at all, uh, such as the Customs Union, certainly um, the, thing, the Common Economic Space of 2003, uh, or it's an international organization that is like the CIS, which is an amorphous, very weak, very fragmented, and even the Evrazes, which is in a way the breakthrough in achieving finally an international organization in, in 2000, even that one can argue was an unfinished project because if you look at its dispute resolution function, it was ultimately set up in 2012 in the context of the single economic space. So fairly low institutionalization, very incremental institutionalization, frequent changes. And that creates a strong institutional context for the emulation. Looking at the emulation, what we see is that the reference to the economic agenda has been fairly easy. Starting from the Treaty on the Economic Union, it instantly adopts the familiar, unmistakably familiar language of the European Union progression, progressive achievement of economic integration, which is not quite the case in terms of institutional design, which has been highly selective. It's been there since the beginning, it's true, it's highly selective, primarily limited to the executive body, where it, which is not the main decision-making body at all, so it is the executive body. Whenever sort of qualified majority is being granted, for example, it's been with regard to selective, very selective issues. And the only situation in 99, with the Customs Union of 99, when there was a uh, an incredible emulation of EU uh, institutions when the acts of the council, the decision-making body, were deemed to be directly applicable in their entirety and really replicating the language of Article 189 of the Treaty of the European Union at the time of, of regulations, directives and decisions. Even that a couple of months later was sort of counter-interpreted in a sort of typical counter-transplant uh, manner. So, normally what we've seen in terms of the viability of this emulation is that it, it, there, there is a limited emulation, restricted, and it's typically sort of non-starters. Projects that have been very weakly institutionalized, they have been non-starters, 
we have the counter interpretation, or they've been fairly safe, where, for example, Russia's veto is completely preserved. If you do the voting arithmetic in FRSS, actually, the integration committee of FRSS, it, uh, it is no danger for Russia's interest in there. So it is a sort of limited safe application of EU style features. And that actually changes with the adoption of the Eurasian Customs Union and especially the single economic space. With the Eurasian Customs Union, again, the institutional context so far has not changed. It is still extremely messy. The Eurasian Customs Union is again a treaty regime within what has now become a defunct international organization, the EFRSS. And there are still huge problems which the Eurasian technocrats themselves feel deeply frustrated that you actually have to implement Russia's WTO obligations by reducing tariffs, but you actually cannot go and represent the customs union in front of the WTO. So the institutional context has been still very low, confused, incrementally changed, and very messy. Emulation, however, still selective, but it's very clear gesture of enhancement. There is more borrowing from the European Union. If one looks at the executive body that was created in 2010, the Commission of the Customs Union, a lot more, uh, you know, it granted certain areas of decision making, transparency. Suddenly, the decisions of the Commission were all published, and publication was actually a, a precondition for their entry into force, and also the, the, uh, the advancements in dispute resolution uh, towards the creation of a court of FRSS. And especially with the single economic space, we see a very concerted uh, styling of the Commission with a lot more elements towards a very similar institution to the Eurasian Economic Commission. So a pattern that is emerging, the narrative is consistent, the reference to the EU has been fairly uncontested prior to the ECO, to the Eurasian Customs Union, is, is, is fairly limited and safe. And we see with the Eurasian Customs Union and single economic space and emulation shift. Uh, however, what one need, shouldn't forget is that the institutional context is still extremely messy, that we have an incremental approach as previous speakers, I think Peter said uh, very clearly, I mean, it is still taking place within a highly centralized, non-democratically personalized political um, regime, and the le high level of political decision making is critical. And there are pending institutional shocks. A new treaty is under negotiation. Possible widening is pending with two member states who are likely to, to come. And they are currently recodifying the whole customs and single economic space legislation. How do we explain this emulation shift? I mean, we basically refer to about three factors, which one, some of them resonate very clearly with what was said in previous um, in the, by the previous speakers. Firstly, regionalism as a script of modernity. Russia. Uh, the, the region building is an important marker of Russia's strength, of Russia's geopolitical ambition, and on top of that, the effectiveness of region building is, is also absolutely important. The CIS and the initiatives in the first table were clearly not able to be used as an institutional delineator, and we see this reference to the EU as the golden standard of integration being used to signal a recommitment, re-engagement, reclaiming this participation in the modern script of modernity. And indeed, as Kasia said in, in her comment question, uh, uh, stating this ambition of its leadership as a rule maker, uh, mm -hmm. uh, similar and equal to the European Union, and in a way, communicating status and modernity. The second factor that we'd like to point out, and again something that I'm sure everybody's thought of, but you know, it's the proximity of and familiarity with the European Union. Again, it is a factor which 
reminds us that diffusion is affected, diffusion of models, normative borrowing is affected by common affiliation and institutional linkages. Indeed, we know that there has been long-term interactions going back to the partnership and cooperation agreements. There has been institutional context. There has been training of experts, you know, from talking to um, various uh, civil servants within the Eurasian Economic Commission in November, we were again strongly reminded of how many people were attending a European Union law course in Maastricht when the Maastricht Treaty was signed and at the same time in Russia there were sort of other uh, disastrous events going on. But it is a very clear, there is a very clear level of, of acqu uh, acquiring uh, competence there. Um, and again, the other argument, the third argument, positioning the economic, the Eurasian Customs Union, single economic space, the Eurasian Economic Union as actually a rival of the European Union in the post-Soviet space. I think Peter um, sort of pointed out um, how important that was. And particularly looking at this emulation shift that became obvious in 2007 to 2010, it coincides with this the European, the European Union's shift from a soft engagement in the region with sort of action plan and, and soft methods to the hard engagement by offering these association agreements which, as Kasia has pointed out in the past, the five kilograms heavy bunch of papers. There is also the fact that the WTO, of course, the Russia's experience in, in terms of WTO, that affected very strongly its ability to respond and participate in this discourse. And what we've seen for, seen, for example, is that a lot of the Russia's negotiators have actually moved to the Eurasian Economic Commission. There's been an exodus as of the summer of, and a lot of new appointments. So we see a lot of normative rival, a lot of norming going on there. But also very interestingly, as it was revealed in the latest crisis in Ukraine, lesson learning. The Russians read the association agreement that the European Union offered to Ukraine. The Russians were telling the Ukrainians, you know, do you actually know what you're signing? So there is, there is a process that's taken place and it certainly, I think, adds a very fascinating ingredient into this cooking pot of what Eurasian integration is. So, thank you. Thank you. As uh, was already mentioned today, the idea of Eurasian integration has deep roots in Russian uh, history and uh, culture. And I think that uh, uh, it was conditioned by the objective semi-peripheral relation of, uh, Russia to, uh, of Russia to Western Europe. And uh, the fear of uh, falling behind the European uh, uh, countries, competitors, haunted Russian elite and Russian state and prompted its regular attempts to modernize itself. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, we can see uh, the signs of this policy from Tsarist Russia to Soviet period and to trace it to uh, modern uh, Russian state. Uh, from this competition followed the idea of integrating the vast uh, Eurasian spaces and to concentrate its uh, uh, population and na natural resources on modernization. And the current attempt of uh, Eurasian integration resembles the Tsarist attempt of modernization because both were uh, undertaken on the basis of the periphery capitalism. Thus, uh, historically, modernization in response to the pressure from the core was the major reason uh, for Eurasian integration but its efficiency always depended on the inner properties of the social system which peoples of the region uh, em embraced. Uh, the current leadership of such CIS countries and states as Kazakhstan, Belarus and Russia uh, and some other uh, uh, state leaders declare that they are set to move their economies away from uh, driven by commodity experts to uh, uh, driven by innovations. The intention is to create uh, millions of new jobs, to introduce new technologies, to modernize uh, economies and uh, societies. 
Uh, and Eurasian integration is, see, is seen by the leadership of uh, CIS uh, countries as a major important condition for uh, such a development. The three leaders of post-Soviet republics returned to the concept of Eurasian integration, which in some respects reminds the thinking of ruling classes in Tsarist and Soviet Russia. Integration is seen as a way to mobilize resources of uh, uh, Eurasian space, uh, uh, Eurasian region, confronting a strong external challenge. And to evaluate the chances of success of the current attempt to establish new union, uh, I think one should start from analyzing the nature of the new social system which was established in the former USSR republics after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, its former republics followed the uh, dependent development, de demonstrating all classical features of development of underdevelopment in the sense in which André Junter Frank meant under this term. I think that he emphasized the, the transformation of uh, productive forces of such societies moving to monoculture production, meeting the needs uh, of the core societies. And at the same time, uh, such societies uh, went through a very deep uh, social transformation, which meant, uh, on the one hand, pauperization of population, creating the reserve army of cheap labor, and on the second place, uh, raising comprador bourgeoisie from their ruling elites, which became a simple mediator in exploitation of their country's cheap human and natural resources. The CIS countries experienced, experienced the corresponding transformations of their economies. In the course of the turmoil of the 1990s, industrial share uh, in the total value added on average declined in the CIS countries from 38 to 29 uh, percent. And uh, you see the different uh, features of industrial degeneration which are common to, the, all, to all these societies. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this in, uh, industrial development of these countries can be interpreted as a structural adjustment of their economies uh, to their new position in the world economy. And such a conclusion uh, can be further substantiated by major trends in foreign trade of the same group of uh, countries. Uh, as the data presented on, uh, at this figure demonstrate, uh, CIS countries export to the rest of the world mainly staple commodities mineral resources, uh, primarily mineral, mineral resources and wood, palm and paper products. Uh, export of manufacturing products is very low. At the same time, if we turn to the structure of imports of the CIS countries from the rest of the world, we will see quite a different picture, quite the opposite picture. Uh, the data show that uh, CIS countries import mainly the products of manufacturing with a high degree of processing. Uh, so uh, this means that these countries export mainly commodities with a low and import mainly goods with high value added. Uh, further, uh, the CIS countries have significant, a significant positive balance of their foreign trade with the rest of the world. The, uh, the figure shows that the net export, export minus import from the CIS countries uh, significantly grows last year. This is an indicator of the growing share of national resources which these nations transfer abroad. This net, net export is the principal source of financing capital flight from these countries. Mm -hmm. And Russia gives a salient example of such development. Uh, look at this table. Uh, the, the data show that uh, net export from Russia net export from Russia uh, amounts to an enormous figure of uh, 8, 4, uh, 14% of GDP. Uh, however, the proceeds uh, from this net export are used not to finance its uh, own development, uh, but to credit the outside world. Capital is exported both by government and by the private sector. And uh, uh, when the, pri the private sector becomes net borrower of uh, external capital, the government sector immediately increases its uh, export of net capital. Uh, and in the whole, Russia always remains a net exporter of capital. 
Naturally, that uh, constantly bleeding economies of the former USSR republics, uh, they mm, uh, can't uh, support their real wages, and the real wages uh, declined enormously. Uh, on this figure, you can see that the official data, official data on real wages in the CIS countries are misleading. Uh, that, uh, in fact, if you recalculate the real wages basing on the uh, prime commodities uh, foundations, uh, which are the main uh, products which uh, workers buy, then you will see that uh, not in a single former Soviet Republic real wage uh, uh, regained the Soviet level. And at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, productivity uh, exceeds the uh, growth of real wages very much. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, in terms of uh, social inequality, Russia is the prime uh, example. According to the Global Wealth Report, Russia has the highest level of wealth inequality in the world, apart from small Caribbean nations which, uh, which uh, with resident bill billionaires. Now, if you take the data in whole, uh, and uh, if you look at the materials of the human development uh, reports, you will see that uh, after uh, more than 20 years of radical market reforms, not a single former, European, uh, former Soviet Union republic uh, comes close to the place which was occupied by the USSR, even uh, including the Baltic states. From this one can see that economies of the CIA countries moved to simplified production structures with declined manufacturing and grown extracting sector of economy. And uh, they just simplified their uh, manufacturing structure. And this made them fit uh, to become suppliers of products with low degree of processing to the uh, developed world. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, that uh, to uh, analyze the perspectives of Eurasian integration, you have to, uh, to uh, get inside how the peripheral position of these countries affected the, uh, their major institutional basis, the big business, the nature of big business. From my standpoint, the ruling classes of the CIS countries experienced two major formative uh, impacts, degeneration of the Soviet bureaucracy in uh, Soviet time and the influence of the financialized world capitalism. The defining feature, uh, feature of the Russian uh, model of corporate governance is the reliance of uh, uh, Russian uh, capitalists on the infrastructure of control over enterprises. Uh, under this term, I mean a set of formal but predominantly informal institutions securing personal control of the dominant groups uh, over the enterprises. Uh, you can see the uh, general outline, general shape of this infrastructure and control at, at this picture. You can single out the external elements of control. Uh, these, are, these contain chain of ownership, uh, major, mainly in offshore sites, links to state officials, and external defense of the property rights, uh, which are provided by the ties with uh, law enforcement uh, agencies and by on private security firms and with criminal uh, organized criminal groups. Uh, the internal elements of control uh, are comprised of centralization of decision making, monitoring and auditing bodies and internal security services. External elements of control uh, are mainly designed to protect um, the rights of dominant groups uh, over the enterprises from uh, it, encroachment of their rivals, while internal elements of control are designed mainly to control uh, their hired uh, labor. Uh, I think that infrastructure of control reflects the specifics of Russian model of corporate governance, characterized by fusion of ownership and management, uh, and hence Russian big business relies on extra economic coercion in uh, gaining profits. Uh, the primarily informal uh, character of control over the assets engenders fundamental instability of the dominant position of big insiders uh, because this control uh, can always be challenged but never can be legalized. 
Uh, and uh, the waves of redistribution of the private property rights regu regularly sweep over the Russian economy. This means that ownership and control are fundamentally unstable and uh, from this stems very mm, myopic uh, short-term uh, time horizon of Russian big business. This short-termism in turn uh, determines the dominant type of income which is most common in Russian big business. Uh, it can be defined as inside the rent uh, and income appropriated by the dominant groups due to their control over the firm's financial flows. And the mechanism of obtaining such rent uh, usually involves figurehead trading companies registered in offshore sites. Uh, thus, uh, the rent extraction fuels corporate conflicts, increases the probability of hostile takeovers, and undermines uh, accumulation of capital by Russian big business. And uh, there is wide empirical evidence of inferior character of uh, uh, investments by Russian big business. Uh, the uh, fixed uh, uh, assets uh, stock of Russian economy became very obsolete. Uh, the average on chemical equipment grew uh, during the uh, radical market reforms time from 12 to 23, 24 years, and the share of machines and equipment exceeding 20 years, or very obsolete, uh, it, it, it amounts to 68% of the whole stock. Uh, we may conclude from the above that Russian big business, and to that matter the big business of all CIS countries, is characterized by semi-feudal reliance on coercion, short-term time orientation, rent-seeking behavior, and inferior investment strategies. Meanwhile, Eurasian integration, as was mentioned above, is seen by the leadership of the major driving force countries of the region as a way to modernization and as, as a way to attain a leap, uh, to make a leap forward in technical progress. Uh, but I think that the nature of institutions of uh, big business in these countries became uh, the greatest obstacle uh, which will thwart these plans. And my last idea that uh, those who would like to know more about the uh, inside the rent model of Russian capitalism uh, can uh, read my last book on this. <laughs> Um, I'm very aware that I'm the one that leads into lunch, so I'm going to try and make it as brief as I can. Um, the paper basically is looking at um, Eurasian integration um, context of the other international institutions um, that Russia is a member of in the region, um, and is from, from a Russian perspective. So I think about um, the rebirth of Eurasia as consisting of two parts, really. There's the promotion of Eurasia as a concept, and the conscious articulation of the Eurasian identity as being something that's meaningful in a political context. And then there's the rise to prominence of political institutions that depend on that concept, so things like the customs union um, or the proposed economic union. Um, and these two things, I think, work in symbiosis with each other. So I think one of the things I'm going to skip over is um, a little bit about how I, I, I look at identity and the roles of um, countries within the international arena as being based on conceptions of how a state should look and then what a state should do, um, but it's in the, the full paper. What I will focus on, um, just briefly, is five themes of Russian identity that have occurred quite frequently within the discourse of Russia's ruling elite, um, and these are I think they, they help when it comes to picking apart the roles that Russia pursues within the Eurasian project and beyond. So the first is great powerism or the historic greatness of the Russian state, which then kind of links into the instrumentalization of the citizenry, often seen as, as a resource essentially for the development of the state, and often admittedly put aside <coughs> as a, a feature of collateral damage uh, when state development is necessary. There's the idea that Russia should and must take its place as an international equal, that it deserves respect in the international arena, but specifically with relation to Europe, that it is a co-author of European civilization um, and that the EU doesn't have the monopoly on what it is to be European. 
In the regional context, it's first among regional equals, so there's a lot of focus on how historically um, eth there's been ethnic Russian regional leadership, almost like a civilizing mission in the region. Um, and that kind of translates more to the pursuit of a soft power role uh, in contemporary international politics. And the final feature of Russian identity that comes up quite a lot is the idea that Russia is a Eurasian bridge due to its unique geographical position between the continents. Um, and in addition to this vast, uh, the civil, civilizing role it's playing over a vast territory, that it's also made massive cultural contributions both to Europe and uh, worldwide more generally. Now when I wanted to come up with something a bit more concrete to think about how the different institutions um, within the region interact with one another, it gave really a, a rather messy picture. Certainly um, the customs union and proposed Eurasian Union, they're just a, they're just a few of very many institutions that vie for influence within the Eurasian region. And these have kind of overlapping and contradictory elements to them, which is why I use quite a bit of the insights from role theory to look at how maybe the specific context in which a state's actions take place can help to explain precisely what sort of um, avenue it might pursue. And although this picture is very messy, um, it, it does quite accurately reflect Russia's preference for a multi-vector foreign policy, which allows some kind of cooperation without the loss of sovereignty, um, and which helps it to consolidate its role as a regional leader and then project that power on the worldwide stage. So at this point I'm going to invite some suggestions, um, which maybe you can come back to me with afterwards in the questions. I've actually split this whole topic into three areas, economic integration, political objectives and military and security cooperation. And that's what I'm going to talk about now and look a little bit at what all of the institutions are, are kind of doing that's relevant there. And it does make for quite a confusing structure, so that's where any great ideas would be very much appreciated. So firstly, economic integration. Um, uh, the Shanghai Corporation Organisation has got a loan facility for members in need, um, but this is kind of dwarfed by a lot of the bilateral um, initiatives that have been taking place, so things like Chinese loans, um, its bilateral energy agreements, and the fact that now it ranks above Russia in its trade importance to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and is also increasing in trade importance to Belarus. So maybe the Eurasian Customs Union can be seen in this light a little bit as a response, or the focus on it can be seen as something of a response. Um, certainly in the short to medium term, it's of greatest benefit to Russia. Um, but it's interesting in the fact that it's a kind of institution-led, rules-based entity, and the Commission's decisions are automatically um, part of the legal base of the Union and the common economic space without having to be ratified further. So it's a little bit different from previous integrative initiatives in that way. Um, it's not based on any idea of democratic conditionality, which sets it apart from the EU-type model of integration. Um, and despite this, um, Putin in particular is very keen to point out that it's compatible with WTO norms, therefore it's compatible, more broadly speaking, with um, European integration. Um, and yet this has brought about quite a few challenges not least the normative challenge of um, democratic conditionality or not, but also practical challenges in terms of, well, in negotiating a, a, a successor to the partnership and cooperation agreement between Russia and the EU, who's that negotiation going to go through and with the EU not wanting to recognise um, the Commission, this presents practical difficulties. Um, maybe this is one of the things that's fed into a, a sort of sense of Russian self-exclusion from um, European integrative processes and a focus on other kind of directions to pursue. Uh, and one of the things I thought was interesting here was things like the vast amount of effort that's been put into self-identifying as a member of BRIC or BRICS, um, which despite questions over what kind of a role they play, realistically speaking in 2010 the BRIC countries did account for 14.5% of world GDP and they have managed to push their um, agenda even into um, the biggest international institutions, so with things like a renegotiation of voting rights in the IMF and the World Bank in favour of developing economies. Um, 
interestingly, all the bricks have kind of regional power bases in their own regions, and it's quite interesting if we then look at Russia's uh, preferred role as a first among regional equals. This is something which is reflected in each of the members there, um, and it also Russia's membership of BRIC also allows it to pursue something of a mediating role between BRIC and the G8, for instance, which again, I think, links back to the idea of how a regional role can push the global agenda, or can give the kind of status necessary for pursuing the global agenda. Um, politically, whilst everybody involved has been quite keen to assert that the Eurasian Customs Union is an economic um, body rather than political, of course, questions arise. Um, and certainly things such as the low economic potential of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to contribute in the long term hints at maybe geopolitical rather than purely economic motivations. Um, symbolically though, the project's quite important. Again, it's, it enables Russia to promote itself as this, this kind of first among equals of uh, regional significance. And as the representative of a region, therefore a body that needs to be taken more seriously in international negotiations in the international arena. Um, I've sort of already covered a little bit about BRIC and the spheres of influence. Um, so maybe it's best if I just quickly mention the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. Um, useful for prov providing a forum for China to interact with CIS countries other than Russia uh, in a multilateral uh, way. Um, but it's also a really good opportunity for Russia and China to kind of promote themselves as um, regionally responsible great powers. Again, that, that same idea of what Russia's role keeps coming back to. And because of its frequent production of um, state declarative statements with equal binding force, it kind of contributes to the discursive production of this thing we know as, of as the Eurasian region, which is becoming of, of greater and greater interest. So finally, and very briefly, I suppose, is the military and security aspect of cooperation. Um, the aspect of military and security cooperation. Um, and certainly, we know of increased Russian disillusionment with the established mechanisms of security in the European context, and the attempt to come up with the European Security Treaty, which sort of fell flat on its face. Unilateral recognitions, Kosovo, um, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, for instance. Um, so it's kind of not surprising that the focus would shift elsewhere. So in terms of the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation, it was originally set up to deal with the negotiation of common borders, and it allows members to engage in joint military or anti-terrorist exercises, which at first were sort of poo-pooed when, for instance, in the peace mission of 2000, Kazakhstan refused to grant transit permissions for Chinese troops, which then had to take a very long way around. Um, but it's becoming, it seems to be coming... Uh, less plagued by issues of mistrust over time, so it was perhaps not a good idea to dismiss it unduly. Interestingly, with the 2007 cooperation agreement with the CSTO, um, issues such as terrorism and trafficking were put more onto the agenda um, for cooperation, which has been maybe seen in quite a negative light by those who question whether it's actually um, a way for trying to deal with civil unrest. So things like the peace mission of 2010 was widely interpreted as dealing with uh, a scenario of civil unrest rather than uh, the, the terrorism kind of scenario that it was promoted as. Um, and even something like the Eurasian Customs Union, again, which is widely promoted as being very much an economic matter, would allow Russia to have a say at the external borders, and that's important when you think about things such as overland drugs traffic. So, to conclude, Eurasian integration isn't a new idea, um, but previous attempts have certainly been very much overlapping and incomplete, but I do think that this is partly deliberate. Um, this has enabled Russia to pursue its preferred multi-vector foreign policy, um, which is increasingly articulated in terms of an evolution of the world system to one of uh, almost existing multipolarity. Um, but it also enables this kind of a very flexible, low commitment approach, which is what has suited Russia's interests the most, and which is what is which has allowed it, and which is what has allowed it to pursue the specific roles in specific areas that it's been keen to do. So, if we look at which roles Russia seems to pursue, well, it's contingent on context, certainly, 
But it's important to remember that having a greater <coughs> regional presence does enable Russia to pursue greater um, interests on at the global stage. Um, the Eurasian Customs Union is the most successful integrative structure to date. It's certainly not free from problems, though, and it remains to be seen whether or not it will um, proceed to the full kind of economic union uh, that's intended. So I think, given Russia's preference for kind of bolstering its chosen roles through competing institutions, uh, it, it sort of remains to be seen whether this integrative project will actually fulfil that potential. Um, and constitute a real change in foreign policy rather than just um, the ability to pick and choose through competing institutions. Thank you very much. So now we have, thanks to very concise mm -hmm. presentations, we now have half an hour for short questions and short, concise answers later. So I will first collect some questions and Rusan, you should come here to face your audience. May I just uh, come here after recording the questions? No? Okay, so Thanks. you can ask him and he will later yeah. and fear to reply. So we start with you, please. Thank you. Um, I read English with Dr. Levis in Cambridge 50 years ago, so that's the context from which I start. But I would like to ask um, um, Mr. Zalazov yeah. whether he would agree that his paper has the function of the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, in what sense? <laughs> what I mean is that what you, what you say undermines absolutely everything else that everybody's said. Because you are suggesting that there is a context of what might be called a mafia situation in Russia, which is likely to be proliferated elsewhere if the um, present situation continues. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the idea of union and integration and all that is a sham. It's a complete sham. What's really happening is that the whole thing is being taken over by crime. That's what I call the elephant in the room. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so directly next one, Saifina. Yes, hello. I'm Sibyl Christenberg from the University of Bremen. So uh, my question is more related to Nika uh, Vezaneva and uh, Katerina Bocciu. So, uh, in your presentation, you talked a lot about this um, Eurasian economic as being a arrival to the European Union in terms of uh, norm, norms, institution, and also economy, and it was also mentioned in earlier presentations. And um, in that sense, um, I think this is very prominent within countries of Eastern uh, uh, partnership. And uh, I would like to know uh, what kind of leverage, if any, actually does the EU has over Russia? Because clearly what happened with Ukraine uh, kind of undermined uh, the European Union. Thanks. Thank you. Further question? Um, yeah, I have a question to Precious, right? Um, your conclusion is that this wide range of competing institutions enables Russia to develop its multi-factor foreign policy. Now I agree, but I think there is something else as well here which hasn't been mentioned, and that is that all these institutions, all these partly competing institutions, enable Russia to do something else as well. That is to base its foreign relations, even within the Eurasian region, on a bilateral basis. It hasn't been mentioned at all. But my experience in a way tells me that this is what Russia's real priority is. That is, having these relations on a bilateral basis instead of having these relations within the, you know, within the framework of uh, multilateral ones. And exactly building this large number of competing institutions enables Russia to do it. Thank you. And there is so many. We continue with David. And I think then we make the first round of answers. Yeah, well, it's uh, really on the European Union. Um, I mean, I thought the paper was good in, institu in its rather institutional approach. But I'm just wondering where, to what extent the European Union is universally regarded as what you call a, gold, a golden standard. I mean, this seems to me to be the, the kind of phrases that we hear from the European uh, political elites. But if you look elsewhere, you know, you, one thinks there's a great deal of Euroscepticism skepticism about the polarization in the European Union, for instance, the lack of development. And furthermore, if you were to look at the European Union now, you look at the level, the conditionality, 
how many countries would actually go into the European Union now if they knew the consequences of the conditionality causes of the European, European Union? So don't you need to rather move away from the institutional approach that you had and look at particular attitudes, look more at the politics of the European Union? Opinion. Thanks for reminding us that we are in the UK and now we have <laughs> the answers. Um, do you want to start? Then we go from here. Too. So, uh, David Cole asked a question about the um, role of mafia in all these integration processes, uh, which reduces the whole thing to, uh, to a scam. Uh, I, I believe that the uh, most important aspect of uh, big business, uh, which should be the driving force of uh, integration, is its authoritarian nature. It is not only a mafia in the sense of uh, corruption and uh, uh, organized crime, uh, but uh, it is uh, uh, oppressive. Uh, it, is, uh, it relies on uh, informal ties with the state, and it is oppressive to workers and rank and file managers. Uh, and uh, uh, it is very aggressive to their colleagues. Uh, I believe that there is no real threat that communists will take over power in Russia and will nationalize all the industry uh, in, in, in favor of a uh, new uh, uh, kind of planning. But uh, our, our big business is under always threat of being um, uh, encroached by uh, brothers, by class brothers from uh, the bourgeois. Uh, surrounding. And uh, I, I think that this is the major problem which uh, determines uh, short-term uh, investment strategies and uh, uh, makes all efforts of the states uh, uh, to integrate very limited. In some limited sense it is possible to promote integration project, for example through customs union, through uh, some lowering of uh, trade barriers, but uh, the, uh, the object uh, the aim, the main aim of the uh, of Eurasian integration, is to become modern, strong society, and uh, this is limited by the nature of social systems of the former USSR societies. Thank you. So your turn. Um, okay. So I, you asked about whether or not the compete, competing institutions were really a way for Russia to pursue its bilateral relations. Um, yes, I think. It's almost like there's another elephant in the room. Bilateral relations are always going to be, especially where Russia is concerned. Um, and I think this, these overlapping and competing institutions do allow for that. Um, but I think they're also useful to Russia. Beyond that, I think they allow more possibilities um, because it's there's there's the process, the regional process as one. But then there's the way in which this allows Russia to um, build itself up in a way that it can try and continue to have global influence in what it sees as this evolving multipolar world. Um, and I think the membership of the institutions does that, firstly by be enabling Russia to, for instance, um, promote itself as the representative of a region or as a, a regionally significant power, but also in slightly more um, subtle ways. So if you look at Russia's relationships with China and India and China and India's relationships with each other, that's a really great opportunity for Russia to kind of act as the linchpin in that relationship. Um, and I think without the use of institutions that would not be as possible and it would not be as easy for Russia to make itself indispensable as it is when that trilateral relationship is brought into play as well. So I think there's a kind of additional level of utility. Thank you. Now, Katarina Frika, who's going to reply? I'm now responsible for um, answering tricky questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I will start with the, perhaps the biggest and most difficult, the leverage that the EU. And I think it's perhaps, I would not agree with framing the discussion in this way. And it certainly has been the way that Russia doesn't like this, this leverage. Um, I think retrospectively, looking at Russia's positioning vis-a-vis -vis the EU, the EU missed a chance in the early 2000s when Russia was talking about this pan-European project. I can see why, because of enlargement, because of fatigue and lack of attention to the East, there was not really much appetite for resetting, basically pressing the reset button with 
EU-Russia relations at the time, but it means the train has left the station and Russia has started, rather than thinking in pan-European terms, whatever it would entail for the EU, started thinking in alternative sort of, um, sort of self-centered ways. So by now, by 2014, I don't think the word leverage is... Um, and if anything, the EU has a very weak geopolitical instinct. It's only when it's confronted with a crisis suddenly EU leaders um, realize that there is something going on, which they were basically oblivious to. Uh, when, when we asked in various people in EU institutions, they really said it's just an association agreement. It's a purely technocratic project. It's about food safety uh, rather than any sort of geopolitical or hegemonic designs. And uh, the, I think this, re this, this approach has really backfired and the EU is now improvising over Ukraine in a big way. The issue of multilateralism and bilateralism, I think it's a very interesting one. Certainly, um, Russia has preferred, in, when it comes to meaningful sort of discussion, you know, doing business, bilateral relations. But I think we are witnessing sort of the contradicting impulses and sort of um, the imperatives that Russia faces in terms of region building. You cannot be perceived as a regional power unless you have basically a region around you. And also different actors, we talk about Russia as a unitary actor when it comes to different countries and different aspects. Certainly different actors within Russia come to the fore. The question is with this sort of natural instinct for bilateralism, which is very effective when it comes to addressing Russia's concern in the near abroad, whether Russia can do multilateralism. And I think there is, the jury is still out and we can see even within the Eurasian Customs Union for example, when it comes to energy and sort of, um, sort of twisting uh, Belarus's fingers or Lukashenko's finger, it's, uh, for example, on energy, we are still about sort of political means, diplomatic means, or energy diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Belarus to ensure that Belarus participates in the multilateral project and doesn't block it. Having said that, we've seen delegation, and I will come back to this in a moment, the actually areas in which Russia, if it invests in this regional project, can actually pursue bilateral, on the bilateral relations. For example, when it comes to customs issues, it cannot anymore, because it's a dom supranatural domain. So actually there, there are some, um, and even in the, on energy, from our talk, I was actually surprised the extent to which doing this regional project, they even talk about harmonizing sort of uh, rules related to the energy sector, where there are greatest sort of sovereign sensitivity when it comes to Russia, and nevertheless, this doing the regional project entails a fairly comprehensive approach, which is not um, at least rejected at this stage. And perhaps to the, to the third, not less tricky question. Um, yes, we may question, and it has been questioned, the EU as the golden standard across the world. Other regional projects, basically, this rebellion against this sort of EU as the template for regionalism. So we have basically two narratives. The EU exists, sort of European studies, I think, exists in a kind of bubble uh, that we are sort of the best template around, whereas comparativist regionalists, they don't have to be comparative, they can just do on work on, Europe, on Asia, but they do study other regions and they said, you know, let's forget about this scholarship and in terms of policy making regarding the, gold, the EU as the golden um, standard. But what we adopt is the point of reference used by the Eurasian sort of, um, region builders. And that's very, very clear that there are references to the EU. So it's the benchmark against which we may agree, you know, there are many cracks, it's one of the greatest paradoxes that the Eurasian project is sort of increases that emulation at the very time when there are so, such major cracks in the European project, but what we see is intelligent lesson learning. For example, when Kazakhstan objects to the monetary union, um, the basically Eurasianist projects of technocrats say actually we are learning from the EU that the monetary union is not the optimal, basically talking about the optimal currency area, let's learn from the Euro experience and let's pause the monetary union for the time being. So even when it comes to justifying this tempo and scope of integration, there are references to negative learning from the, from the EU as well as positive learning. So from basically our empirical work, we have not come, I think, once in our meetings in the Eurasian Commission, another integration project was mentioned. Otherwise, in terms of, was in, in terms of positive and negative lesson learning from the EU alone.
So I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. So we have time for another round. There were many questions. Please raise your hands again. because. Um, so I think I just start here and go once round, and we will now select very many questions. Please, please be prepared. You will get, I think, ten questions at least. Um, I hope they will be spread rather equally. And here we start. Please. Okay. So I'll think about this now. That's what you think. Uh, but actually, carrying the conversation where it was left off with the, the EU Golden Standard and look, taking an institutional approach, uh, um, I would say that I'll ask you. In terms of looking at certain problems of implementation, uh, not problems but uh, solutions of implementation, that there are certain problems are constrained by nature. So, the linguistic framework, if you're trying to achieve integration at the most functional level, you can only do so many things. Right. And, and you know, so the golden standard by, is a natural outcome, not a you know necessarily the political dialogue and all can fo follow on from there. So, I, I wonder if that, if you feel <coughs> that way about it. Uh, the second question was uh, to yourself, when you um, uh, talked about, I was very interested in the, my pet topic, which is the production and, and, and industrial policy, that how the CIS uh, simplified its manufacturing and, and other industrial sort of output mechanisms, would you say that that was only because that it, a decline, or could you see that it was a more sm smarter strategy in terms of understanding the global supply chain and how the global economics was at that time, point in time. So for CIS, smaller countries to remain within the you know, production or, or, or economic realm, rather than simply drop off as a failed economy. They needed to simplify to just remain in the play. And I wonder what you think about that. Uh, and finally, um, um, regarding uh, the last presentation, <coughs> I have a couple of points very quickly I'd like to make. Uh, one is that the the SEO discussion of security versus economics. And, and obviously that would remain uh, a fertile topic of discussion, but given that majority of the actors within SEO have very different security trajectories and priorities, which, which can almost never meet, uh, even when they are common points. I mean, whether they're smaller countries or big countries. So economics or, or, or economic type of discourses would tend to be the glue, um, or sustainable glue, I would like to say, going forward. Um, and uh, I, I would be slightly careful of dismissing uh, what Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan can do going further into the, the economic input into the story. Because we again have to understand the supply chain of what they produce. Uh, uh, large aluminum plants which, which give aircraft industry in Russia a particular advantage in certain places. And equally, when we look at your, uh, the very last point I'd like to make is that the China India point, you said how Russia acting as a linchpin. Now that's a bit romantic, I would say, because uh, the China and India's own relationship has deepened and it's, it has left, it's not been in the, in the discussion in media. So one doesn't actually follow as to how deep that is, you know, uh, growing. But fundamentally we see an opposite reaction, that how India's own relationship with Central Asia has been watered down because it has always tried to use Russia as a linchpin. So there's a counter uh, narrative there, so I'll stop there. Thanks. So, you see the 10 questions I promised are already, already done. done. <laughs> <laughs> 15 still. We still continue. You are the next one. So then, yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions for the first presentation. Yeah. For the first two presenters. Uh, the first one um, is related to the idea of European Union as a reference model and I don't think that this uh, reference is strictly connected to uh, the latest project, a region project. Um, and if we look at the um, late 90s, we can find a couple of very interesting interviews, for example, re released by uh, Berezovsky, uh, who explicitly referred to CIS in continuity or in reference with the European Union. So how to make sense of these two moments, one during the tentative reform of CIS and the other one uh, uh, from like since 2007 as you told before. And the other one is uh, related to the very idea, the very concept of emulation. To what extent uh, this is um, actual emulation and not uh, the so-called like institutional pseudomorphism or 
normative hybridization, to which it, to what extent um, the like we can uh, reflect about the decoupling between uh, institutional design and the normative content that an institution, a certain institution conveys. Thank you. Thank you. So you are next? Yes. Um, again, a question for the first presenter. First of all, thanks to all three presenters for the excellent presentation. And with regards to the Eurasianism as an economic reality, it has two aspects, trade and investment, and of course, industrial development. But in order to have industrial development, one needs capital investment. So uh, considering the flight of capital from Russia, how viable is the access of private companies, private capital, I mean, private firms to capital through which channels and uh, then who invests in Russia? Is it China? And in this case, <laughs> they have in terms of capital inflows if there is an actual integration with China rather than with the European Union. By the way, uh, when I was looking at the trade balance of Russia and Ukraine, China is either the third or the second partner in terms of the amount of trade and they have both negative trade balance with China. So to what extent is this reality, in this reality, in this Eurasianism concept, um, China being the shadow partner? Thanks. Any more questions on the window side? Yes? The last one. Uh, yes, uh, uh, my question is also uh, to the first, uh, uh, to the author of the first uh, paper. In the context of the first panel, how would you relate to the uh, discussion of the development of uh, this idea of uh, Eurasia? Because if we look at this process as an emulation of European Union, it is pretty. It looks pretty incompatible with the idea that Russia is doing its own thing. Um, to oppose the European Union, to present an, an alternative. And I can um, refer to three facts. For example, a lot of that institutional um, integration within, broadly speaking, Eurasia actually predates uh, the point when uh, Eurasianism became dominant in Russian foreign policy discourse. Certain, certain for example, a second point, for example, if Russian foreign policy discourse as Eurasian refers to some uh, common heritage or civilization of Russia with Central Asia, etc. Why do we see most arm twisting directed towards Belarus, Ukraine and Moldova and not to Tajikistan and Kazakhstan to bring them into the fold? And um, then and, and the third point is from the point of view of that ideology of Eurasianism, of this new Eurasianism, bilateral relations to bring them to those countries into a union with Russia would work just as well. So multilateral uh, institutions, uh, which you discussed, sort of you, you referred to as uh, the newest uh, enterprise, uh, they, they seem to be not quite necessarily in line with that. So how would you uh, uh, describe, in your view, the connection between the development of this latest Eurasian ideology of Russian foreign policy and actual things which are happening in Russian uh, foreign policy in terms of institution building. Thank you. Now, Pete Dutton had a question. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, first for Wielke and uh, Cassia. Um, is, uh, isn't it the case that the EU experience is that the very process of integration uh, is inimical to democracy? I'm thinking particularly about the uh, introduction of the euro. So that's just a short question. And uh, 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 for Ruslan, if I, Ruslan, if I may, um, yep. your um, uh, very interesting table on Gini coefficients, where you talked about the increase in inequality mm -hmm. um, in the CS countries, and particularly in Russia, as you said. Is there, are there any explanations for the contrary trends? Because in Armenia, Kazakhstan, and uh, Ukraine, after the Orange Revolution, inequality actually diminished. The, the, the states seem to become more equal. What are the factors in that? Thank you. Sorry, sorry, uh, I didn't quite uh, understand. I beg your pardon. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at your table three yeah. of Gini yeah. coefficients. Mm -hmm. Normally, as you say, in mm -hmm. most CIS countries, and in particular in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, inequality has increased. Mm -hmm. And that ties in entirely with what David was saying earlier about the effects of globalization and mm -hmm. neoliberalism. But there are the, the opposite occurs in some states. In Armenia, in Kazakhstan and in Ukraine after the Orange Revolution. I'm wondering why has inequality diminished 
-hmm. over the last two years in some of the CIS states. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ray has a question. Uh, yes, and quickly, thank you to all our presenters for fantastic and informative presentations. Uh, my question is directly to Ruslan. Mm -hmm. I read your paper beforehand. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. And it um, echoes a lot of my own thinking on the matter that I couldn't quite demonstrate today in my presentation. But I have a perfectly self-serving question here. Um, it seems like many of us have sort of um, characterized Eurasianism from the Russian perspective today as, as a very much an executive-driven process. And your presentation would seem to suggest that in, in some respects, given um, the potential hesitancy with which Russian capitalists approach the topic of Eurasian integration. But is there something um, that, that I'm missing here? Are there existing social forces in Russia that are also contributing to this Eurasianist dialogue um, in ways that might escape us right now? So are, are there some big capitalists in favor of Eurasian integration, to put it shortly? Thank you. Thank you. Any more very, very short questions? Not really, okay, but still I see you are willing to sacrifice lunch for a good discussion. So what I now would suggest is that we give five minutes to each of the presenters to make all the points they really want to make, and we will be less than ten minutes late for lunch. So who wants to start, who is prepared for five minutes? I'll yeah. go first because I've got the list. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so uh, yes, some really good points. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I thought actually following on from what you said about the security and the economic debate with the um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, maybe that the fact that this, the security side of things is continually pursued anyway, regardless, might be quite interesting when we think back about the discursive production of the region. So, yeah, that was that's food for thought. Thank you very much. And also again, very just interesting and thank you about the point about India's relationship with Central Asia being watered down. Something that we really look at. Right, so we continue, Katarina? Um, I'll start ah, and okay. Kasha will fill in if I have a minute left. <laughs> I'll try to scramble the questions and the answers as I feel there are several parallel themes there. I mean, it is indeed very interesting. We've looked at design, as we said, and the narrative that frames this design. And whether we like it or not, there is actually, in terms of structures, agreements, institutions created, there is a move from bilateral to multilateral, and there is a move from soft to hard. You know, there may be ways to ensure flexibility within this design, and indeed we talk about that in, in our book, but ultimately Russia's margin of uh, functioning seems to have been constrained in, on paper in terms of formal design. And there the emulation of the EU is very visible. Now, the question then is, what happens next? So in terms of the, how do we evaluate that is, is the next question, and indeed the more interesting part of the paper. Um, is it semantic? Is it a form or substance? Um, what is it? And indeed what, the, what you raised in terms of implementation comes to it. Um, does it penetrate domestic level? Because if we look at European Union experience, it's the European Union is interesting also in terms of the so-called Europeanization process that countries are engaged in whereby domestic level is penetrated. We see that the common design actually makes it with, for example, the binding decisions of the Commission, penetration at domestic level becomes possible. But it's also there where we see the most serious limitations and challenges to this project because Ultimately, the project, the, the destiny of the project is at the domestic level. And it is as good as domestic institutions are. No matter what the Commission does, it's the laboratories and the customs points in Kazakhstan and the separate porters that will do it. And there, we see that the model perpetuates domestic regimes and domestic structures. And, and you know, this is a, takes us to a different conversation, which I'd love to have. Uh, similarly, if we compare it to the Eurasianist, uh, your question, the Eurasianist discourse, again, it, it, as I started in the beginning, I mean, it adds another theme in the, in the cooking pot. There clearly is the Eurasianist agenda. Um, our colleague Julian Cooper actually argues that 
the Eurasian Customs Union project served to enliven Eurasianist discourses in Russia rather than the other way around. Again, it is an interesting question to examine, but it tells us something about how we can interpret uh, what we see. Because at the level of design, it is a very clear move, very clear ambition. Ultimately, if Russia follows the law, it will be constrained. Now the question then is how we interpret that and how Russia interprets legality ultimately and, and whether it, it chooses to be bound by legal design. And I think here we take to go to Richard Sackler's dual state paradigm. You know, would that apply to the regional level as well? And it ultimately that's where we will see what happens. And finally, um, the Berezovsky Yes, it is a, it's been a consistent narrative. That's, it is absolutely clear. Uh, we do actually see, however, that this narrative is restyled and it is a lot more comprehensive at the moment. You know, certainly 2011, 2012. In terms of emulation or institutional isomorphism or mimicry, uh, again, I would say how we interpret the meaning of, of this move to design is is a question that would, would take in a separate piece. <laughs> I'll just fill in, in a way, I, don't, I would like to emphasize the challenge that we face in terms of analytical benchmarks when it comes to emulation. You know, any study of the EU starts from the treaty bases and the key institutions. Mm -hmm. And at least at that level, we have already a comparator. Mm -hmm. But we don't have an, an analytical framework. Most comparative projects of different integration regimes, when they realize actually that the EU is so different from the rest, EU entrenched basically in its own uh, studying and studying diffusion processes like Tanya Brozel and Thomas Fries in Berlin. What other projects are compared amongst themselves. Now we have unprecedented, I think, in terms of comparative regionalism, sort of this emergence of two regions of, with deep economic integration. When we talk about sort of emulation and superficiality, we talk about mimicry, but nevertheless there's much more to compare and we don't have clear benchmarks. What do we compare and how, and especially when it comes with this strong path dependency in the post-Soviet region. Um, the issue of economics is very complex. We're not going to give justice to it. Um, but the fact is that there are complex processes going on. What is clear that we could not trace domestic demand. The literature on comparative regions is very strong on economic actors demanding, basically, um, pulling of sovereignty to derive, you know, for the sake of economic development. We have not observed this phenomenon um, with the Eurasian integration, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. What is, has been, for example, reported that in the uh, um, regions bordering Kazakhstan, which has a more business-friendly regime, the regional authorities in Russia are deregulating, creating more business-friendly environment for Russian businesses to make sure that they don't go actually and register in Kazakhstan. So this sort of uh, regulatory templates already being amended. It's maybe small scale, regional scale, but nevertheless we see those sort of processes going on. But it is about the quality of domestic institution. It's not about tariffs where the economic impact of the Eurasian integration project is to what extent it improves governments, governance in general in the member states. And I'll stop here. And the democracy question is huge. We can talk about it in the <laughs> Actually, I think she, she stops to give Ruslan a chance to answer questions. Uh, I have to be very concise because the uh, time for tenure is uh, started again already. Uh, there was a question about the reasons of uh, uh, such uh, failure in industrial policy in the CIS countries. Was it the result of uh, some uh, design or was it the objective result of uh, fitting the global value chain? I think uh, it, it is the second, because if you want to move to capitalist economy and be integrated in the world capitalist system, you have to join global production networks and there uh, newcomers can fill under the uh, places with, uh, on the low side of the value chain. Uh, and uh, this uh, gives me an opportunity to move to the question about whether there are any capitalists in Russia who are in favor of uh, real integration uh, on the basis of developing manufacturing. Uh, I think that there are not very many such people among big business because uh, exactly on the same reason, Russian big business seeks to find its place in the world system uh, and uh, 
uh, this is the uh, low value chain uh, part. And uh, as far as I understand from some particular case studies, Russian big business, when it invests in Ukraine or Kazakhstan or other Belarus or other um, the former uh, Soviet Union republics, it tries to find uh, the sources of cheap natural resources and uh, cheap labor, which will, uh, they uh, would like to find some cheaper resources than in Russia. So it is the same approach. Uh, the only real force which opposes this, as, uh, which I see, is a middle and uh, small business which is opposed to big business in Russia because it is suppressed by big business. And these people are much more in favor of uh, real integration or the more that they are more inclined to, uh, they are more friendly to Slavophile type ideas, Eurasianist ideas, but they have no real political representation and their influence is negligible. And there was a question about China, if I understood it appropriately, what role China plays in, in integration processes and in financing investments in uh, CIS countries. Uh, I think that uh, I don't know much about the uh, great role of China in financing investment. China is a great uh, trade partner and uh, uh, many uh, cheap, uh, and cheap goods from China illegally penetrate uh, uh, um, the uh, custom unions market and uh, uh, China seen uh, by uh, Russian government both and elite both as a um, uh, rival and competitor and a partner. Uh, but uh, I don't see China as a great source of investment in our economies. And uh, the last uh, question was about the Gini coefficient. Uh, I think that in Armenia and Kazakhstan uh, this trend is due to a uh, much greater role, especially in Kazakhstan, of the state as a uh, redistributor of uh, national income. But uh, uh, how Ukrainians achieved this result is a complete enigma for me, because it seems that uh, the state doesn't play any constructive role in this sense, so I can't answer this question. I personally would say quite often when you deal with statistics, you have to be aware how they are being made. Not just that they are manipulated, but also questions of the competence. If you look at the Gini coefficient for Azerbaijan, it used to highlight high equality just because middle income households did not participate in the survey, so they simply refused to answer and the coefficient was just calculated with the answers that were given and so it was more equal just because a specific part of the population did not take part. This doesn't say very much about society. Um, so we can continue all these discussions over lunch. Thank you very much.